your brain controls everything you do, including learning. And if we don't teach people how to love and care for their brains, they're going to be thrown around by the negative forces in society. Your new project is phenomenal, and we're going to get into it and why you constructed it the way that you did. But I want to ask you right out of the gate because you have accumulated over 200,000 SPECT brain scans from your clinics and from people from 155 countries plus at this point. If anybody knows about how quickly the brain can change, it's you. How quickly can we actually make improvements to our brain and cognitive health? So I actually did the big NFL study. When the NFL was lying, they had a problem. And I saw that within two months, 80% of my players showed improvement on their scans. And then I was in my clinic and I was doing a lecture um, and a number of patients showed up and one of the kids, he was 25 years old, raised his hand and he goes, I just love you so much, but you're not going to love what I do. And I'm like, well, what's that? And he said, I'm a mixed martial artist. And I'm like, well, I can love you, but yeah. that's bad for your brain. And so I looked at his brain with him and it was bad. And I got this idea of, I know these supplements work to enhance brain function, but I don't know how fast they work. So this was at night. I said, why don't you come back the next morning at eight o'clock, I'm gonna give you these supplements uh, it was brain and uh, body power max and focus and energy, two supplements I used in my NFL work. And I said, and I'm gonna scan you two and a half hours later. And he's like, oh, that's so cool. His brain was dramatically better two and a half hours after he took the supplements. Now, it didn't mean it was fixed it. Right. It meant his brain could respond almost immediately. And if you keep doing the right thing, your brain can be better an hour from now. Your brain can be better tomorrow. Your brain can be dramatically better. I do a show, you've been on it, Scan My Brain, right? I have your brain. I have Troy Gloss's brain. He's the 2002 World Series MVP. He's third baseman for the Angels. And 16 months ago, his brain was awful because uh, he's drinking too much and had four concussions and he was a mess. Two months later, he's much better. Well, I just did his 16 month follow up and his brain's radically better. Mm. And I know in three or four years, his brain will flat out be normal. How exciting is that? Nobody knows that you are not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better, but you can also make it worse like next hour right. if you smoke pot mm -hmm. and probably should talk about that. Or if you drink alcohol or if you sleep deprive yourself. Um, so every day your brain is getting better or it's getting worse. I just wrote down Mary Jane to circle back and talk about, but you know, when we're talking about brain health, we're talking about everything about us, you know, because as I've learned from you, our brain impacts every cell in our bodies, essentially. Everything about our, you know, a governor of what's happening with our heart, with our, with our, this gut brain connection, so much can go wrong if we're not taking care of our brain. And also of course our mental health, which we'll talk about too. And so those kind of improvements for me, that means systemic improvements. And what you saw in those scans, you, you saw an indication of better blood flow within, again, a couple of hours. And some of the things that you actually mentioned that were in that supplement combination were things like omega-3 fatty acids, phosphatidylserine, and I think ginkgo was ginkgo. one of those as well. Ginkgo biloba, right? Both lobes of the brain. And these are all simple things that have a ton of peer-reviewed data to back them up. And that's what you use. Like 
and I, I remember talking with you about this. It's just like when people say the supplements don't work or especially in the in the healthcare space, it's just like, do you read? Because the data is existing, <laughs> you know, it's right there at your fingertips. And so, you know, the reason I want to ask you this right out of the gate is obviously we've we've experienced a lot of bad things for our brains the past couple of years. And one of the best things we can do to get our citizens healthier and more resilient is to improve our brain health. And one of the biggest barriers to taking action to improve our health was the statement, we can't get people healthier overnight. And so we do superficial stuff instead of what's proven. And so for me, this is a huge stamp of evidence that we can start getting better like today. And with that said, this leads me to your new book and you're mapping it out over 365 days, step by step, little bit at a time, and a miraculous shift can take place over the course of a year. Why did you create a book that's spreading things out over the course of a year? Brain and mental health are daily practices. So you've been a trainer, physical health. It's not a once a week thing, right? If you want to be healthy and strong, it's an everyday process. Spiritual health is not just on Saturday or Sunday. It's every day. If you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it, you have to do it every day. These are the daily habits. But there's nowhere in school they teach you. I spoke at a big California education conference and the director of curriculum was there and she heard me lecture and she loved it. And I asked her, I said, how many brain health courses does the state of California have for their students? And then she looked down at her shoes. And when she looked back up, she said, none. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's insane because your brain controls everything you do, including learning. And if we don't teach people how to love and care for their brains, they're going to be thrown around by the negative forces in society that are damning us, that are ruining us from processed foods to the messages about alcohol and marijuana to digital gadgets that steal our dopamine. Um, it's a show. Our, our current society, the epidemic of adolescent depression, especially in girls, is skyrocketing. It's like 30%, one in three teenage girls has significantly thought of suicide. I'm like, no, that is not okay. And it's different than at any other time during my lifetime. Yeah, and you've got, you know, you've been here for a while you know, kicking ass and taking names. And so for you to see it firsthand, this isn't just like better diagnostic technology. This is like, no, there's a serious problem. Things have really skyrocketed. And, you know, you mapping it out. Can you talk about the way that you've constructed the book for us to use it? So I thought about this, brain and mental health are daily practices. Mm -hmm. And never was that more true than during the pandemic. And yes, the pandemic hurt a lot of people, but a lot of people got seriously well True. during the pandemic because yeah. they didn't have to go, they didn't have to drive to work. So they had an extra hour and a half or two hours a day because they were doing everything from home. And a whole group of people that I know, their brain and mental health skyrocketed. How did that, they do that? It's a daily practice. So they put in the daily habits. And I thought, if you could spend a year on my psychiatrist's couch, what would I teach you? If I just had five minutes a day to plant these big ideas into your head. And I love this book so much, Change Your Brain Every Day, because it's the most important things I've learned over 40 years of helping people and helping myself. And so it starts with loving your brain. And I start the book with, you're not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better and I can prove it, but you have to start by loving 
yourself, which means you have to start by loving the organ that makes you you, which is your brain. And every day there's a quote from me, one of the most important things I've said, a little essay that takes like two or three minutes to read, and then an exercise. And my favorite exercise of all of them is whenever you go to make a decision, just ask yourself, is this good for my brain or bad for it? And I talk about a game I played with Chloe. Chloe is who you met. Um, she's 19. But when she was two, we played this game called Chloe's Game. And I'd go, is this good for your brain or bad for it? And if I said blueberries, she'd go, are they organic? <laughs> because non-organic blueberries hold more pesticides than almost any fruit. And I'm like, of course they're organic. She goes, two thumbs up, God's candy. Or if I said avocados, she would go, two thumbs up, God's butter. If I said talking back to your redheaded mother, she'd go, oh, <laughs> very bad for your brain. <laughs> but so just planting the idea, and the brain is lazy. Your brain is going to do what you've allowed it to do. And so change is hard. So it needs to be incremental, simple, and persistent. Yeah. And I love this format because we could take one nugget a day. You just mentioned planting seeds. And obviously, there's so much within a seed, for example. You know, there's an entire oak tree within that acorn. Matter of fact, if we carry that out, it's a forest, you know, of all the generations that are potential in that one thing. But it doesn't matter if it's not planted on fertile ground. And you're helping to keep the ground fertile by having this daily tilling practice, this daily watering practice that you just said, it could be five minutes or less, just literally reading one page because you have it mapped out day one, day two, day three. There's lessons, there's insights, there's stories. And especially if we might find ourselves because you know, we might have a target on how many books we're going to read in a year, for example, and maybe we struggle and we have more shelf help than self help, right? Just so many <laughs> books we buy and they're just sitting on the I shelf gathering dust. This is providing such an easy on ramp for us to feel accomplished each day by reading one page and taking that to day two, day three, day four. And I want to go through some of these days that jumped out to me because I got a chance, obviously, to read the book in advance. And I'm so grateful for that. And one of the things, one of the nuggets that you shared was earlier on in the, in the book, you talked about brain reserve. And I think it's such an important, not just concept, but it's a reality. And especially when we're dealing with stress and being able to build that reserve is important. Can we talk about the concept or the idea of brain reserve and how we can improve it? So brain reserve is the extra tissue and function you have, brain tissue, brain function to deal with whatever stress comes your way. I was an army psychiatrist for seven years and I realized, um, put two soldiers in a tank, expose them to the same blast, the same force, the same angles. One of them walks away unharmed. Another person is permanently disabled. Why? It depended on the brain reserve or the brain health they brought into the accident and brain reserve is happening throughout our whole life and even before we're born it's the health of the mother it's the health of the father so parents who smoked as teenagers their children have less reserve parents who are under great stress when their mothers, when they're pregnant with a child, that child is born with less reserve. Parents who are smoking pot, you know, in Durango, Colorado, the incidence of babies born with marijuana is up 1700%. It's horrifying that baby's going to have less reserve. And then it depends on what happens throughout your life. Those of us that played football, we're stealing our reserve. I had no clue, but stealing our reserve. Those of us that grew up on fast food, um, less reserve. Those of us that grew up in houses of high adverse childhood experiences, stealing our reserve. 
those of us that grew up with parents who cared, parents who paid attention, parents who read with us every night, more reserved. And so every day, and it happens throughout your whole life, every day you're building reserve, money in the bank for brain health, or you're stealing reserve. Mm. And if you go to bed a half an hour early, you're building reserve. If you decide to stay up and, well, I'm just gonna finish this series, on Netflix and you go to bed at one o'clock and you have to be up at five, you just stole a whole bunch of reserve because you know this, when you don't sleep properly, it turns off 700 health promoting genes, which means trash begins to build up in your brain and it steals reserve. You know, one of the one of the many things that I love about you is that you don't pull any punches. You tell people the truth and you also direct us to empowerment. So, for example, as soon as I read this and, of course, hearing you say it right now, if a mother smoked when you were in the womb, it's like that's my mom, you know. And so I feel like I'm, I've had something stolen from me in a sense. And it's just like I'm already messed up. But then I realize, again, there's so much that you could do now here to nourish your brain and to build that reserve. And it's kind of that concept of like the, the cards that you're dealt, it's how you play them, you know? And I think back to my brother and sister, it wasn't just the smoking in the womb, it's like now secondhand smoke in the environment. And this is like the early 80s. And so my little brother and sister, there was this gap where I'm five years older than my little brother. And there was a time when I went to live with my grandmother in a very nourishing environment right, where there wasn't this toxicity in the air, literally, and also just this kind of focus on magic, you know, not like she's like, you know, David Copperfield or something like that, but like just creating magical moments, celebrations, creating an atmosphere of, of, of safety and joy and, and also education, right? So I'm getting all of this, these inputs, and then you can see me excel in school, like at a, in, incredible degree that my nobody else in my family had ever achieved before right and it actually became kind of second nature and then I think about my brother and sister on the other hand and the comparison there and them not being in that nourishing environment and also at the same time because number one then my heart would break for them but then it goes back to this thing your empowerment which is what can, you can do so much right now we don't have to be tied to those stories of the past you know I love uh my wife so much and she often talks about responsibility she had cancer when she was in her 20s and then got depressed and went to a seminar taught by her heroin addict uncle so he scared her a lot when she was a child but he got clean and started teaching seminars and he asked her how much responsibility do you want to take for the cancer and depression. And she got angry Ooh. and she's like, it's not my fault. And he didn't say, he said, I didn't ask you if it's your fault. He said, responsibility is your ability to respond to the situation. And that was the moment the light went on in her. And I wrote one of my first books in 1986, uh, it's called The Sabotage Factor, all the ways we mess ourselves up from getting what we want. And as a young psychiatrist, I knew if you blamed other people for how your life was turning out, you weren't getting better because you're a victim and victims are powerless. But if you just think of responsibility, how much do I want for my ability to respond? So, for example, if I'm having trouble with her, it's easy to blame her, right? I mean, we're, we're sort of living in a blame, shame filled society, which is so toxic. But if I'm having trouble, it's like, okay, what is it that I can do today that makes this better? So whatever hand I was dealt, um, well, what is it that I can do today to make it better. And one of the exercises in the book, one of my favorite exercises, is the one page miracle. On one piece of paper, write down what you want. Relationships, work, money, 
physical, emotional, spiritual health. Write it down. It's got to fit on one piece of paper. And then ask yourself, this is the exercise. Write it down. Does it fit? Does my behavior fit the goals I have for my life? And blame isn't on that list at all. It, what do I want? So with Tana, I want a kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship. Always want that. Don't always feel like that. I get these rude thoughts in my head, but I mostly don't say them because <laughs> it doesn't fit, right? So this isn't about what I should want, what somebody else wants for me. What do I want? You have to tell your brain what you want because your brain makes happen what it sees. And if you see disaster, you're gonna feel awful. Yeah. If you see hope, you're gonna feel hopeful. Yeah, yeah, I love this. It's so simple, you know, it's giving the brain a directive. My youngest son, Brayden, the other day, I was getting some water and he came by to get something. He was just like, you can't achieve your goals if you don't have any. And I was like, oh, that was, <laughs> that's profound. Like, where'd you get that, you know? And it's so true, it's giving us a directive, you know, like so often we, we want stuff or we want to feel better. Like, what does that look like in getting clarity, you know? And you just said something really profound I want to dig into more because it was one of the daily lessons. You said that our brains are really sneaky, right? So you just said you have those crazy thoughts occasionally. And the thing is, we all do. We all think some crazy stuff. And if somebody was a peek inside of our brains, they would lock us up easily all of us every single one of the billions of people on the planet but you share that the brain is sneaky and we also have this prefrontal cortex to kind of keep things in check yeah i love the movie with mel gibson and helen hunt uh, what women want and it just gives you a look at sort of the nutty thoughts that when mel gibson's hearing what women think it's driving him crazy and I think it was Jerry Seinfeld who said the brain is a sneaky organ. We all have weird, crazy, stupid, sexual, violent thoughts that nobody should ever hear. And when you have a good prefrontal cortex, it inhibits it. But most people don't know that's normal. And it's not the thoughts you have that make you suffer. It's the thoughts you attach to. And I was 28 years old in my psychiatric residency at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. So that's where I did my psychiatric residency. I was 28, and one of our professors said, you have to teach your patients not to believe every stupid thing they think. And it was a light bulb moment because in my head, I'm like, well, I believe every stupid thing I think. And that had caused me so much suffering. And so now that I know if I have a crazy thought, it's not me. Thoughts come from all sorts of places. They actually come from our ancestors. They're written into our genetic code. So we know, for example, if people have parents, grandparents, great grandparents that grew up in trauma. So they particularly studied children, grandchildren of the Holocaust, that they're born with more anxiety. They're born with a greater propensity to have post-traumatic stress disorder. And so no, some of your thoughts are not yours. I don't know if you've ever interviewed Mark Wolin, but he's got this fascinating book called It Didn't Start With You. Mm -hmm. And the generational trauma is common in a lot of people and they have no idea. And it's not something to drug, right? I mean, that's what's happening in our society now. It's like, oh, you're anxious, you have panic attacks, let me give you Xanax and Ambien to sleep and Lexapro so you don't worry so much. No, it's something to explore. And I often will do generational histories with my patients. And when I learned about it, I actually went and talked to my dad who told me, and, and you know, they, they don't tell you unless you ask them. It's like, did grandpa or grandma have any significant trauma? And my grandfather, when he was 19, um, his brother uh, just moved to LA, was not a good driver. His car stalled on a railroad track 
and he got killed in a collision of the train with uh, his car. And my grandfather was had grief and was furious at his sister for letting her brother drive the car. And just think what that shock yeah. did to his genes. And so it changed the epigenetics in his sperm before he made my dad, which means I'm gonna be more likely to be anxious. And how would you know? And just that knowledge goes, oh, it's not mine. Oh, I can put that down because it belongs to a different generation. Yeah, oh my goodness. Now this, if this was discussed a few decades ago, this would sound more like a soft science. But today we know that these changes are very, very real and it just makes logical sense because of adaptation, evolution. You know, your, our offspring are going to be encoded in a way that they can survive in an environment that is ripe with threats, right? It's just helping to make an adaptation for survival. And a friend of mine, she's a neuroscientist out of NYU, Wendy Suzuki, and she shared with me how, and also your wife and I talked about this as well, but there was this really wonderful experiment uh, done with done with mice and exposed to stressors and having their offspring creating essentially these mutations that created mental health disorders in the mice. But you can change it for future generations by exposing those mice to enriching environments, right? So moving them out of that threatful scenario and now they have what she described as Disney World for mice that they got to live in with access to healthy food and movement practices and you know, healthy relationships essentially with access to other mice and the, the genes that they passed on or the genetic kind of template to future generations was now changed. And it wasn't kind of coded for stress and anxiety and all those things. So we have, you talk about this in the book too, which is so wonderful. We have the ability, our choices right now are affecting our children and our grandchildren and to take that more seriously. We need to take it more seriously because it's not about us. It's not just about us. It's about generations of us. And every day at home, you are modeling hell or you're modeling illness. And, you know, some people go, oh, that's harsh. No, it's the truth. John 8.32, know the truth. And the truth will set you free. It's a shit show um by what's being modeled for us in society the super bowl had 30 alcohol commercials the world series had 30 one game 30 alcohol commercials it's, it's nuts what is happening and what we're allowing our children to see so even during the presidential debate i'm still irritated by this uh i was watching and one of the news anchors asked then Vice President Biden if he was going to federally legalize marijuana. And he said, the science is not in. I am not in favor of that. And then Cory Booker shamed him. On national television, he said, man, are you high? And I was furious because Biden was actually right. The science more and more is pointing to big trouble, especially for teenagers and young adults who use marijuana. And But it's this notion that we can belittle people, we can put them down, we can shame them. And it's like, Booker, do you have no shame? It's like, seriously? <laughs> and on national television. And uh, I'm just very concerned in Change Your Brain Every Day. There's 30 days where I have, where I imagine if I was an evil ruler and I wanted to create mental illness, what would I do? And I'd basically create American society. And my favorite little story is about a girl, and my wife hates when I pick on the Girl Scouts, when the, a Girl Scout sets up a Girl Scout cookie stand outside a pot dispensary in San Diego. <laughs> oh, and it's a brilliant like move. 300 boxes of 
cookies. <laughs> and I'm like, evil ruler genius. Mm, yeah. Right? It's got little <laughs> girls to sell toxic food to potheads. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, yeah, you, you just said it. And so this actually opens the door to this conversation, which is obviously there's um, there's a movement taking place looking at some of the beneficial compounds within that particular plant, right? And there's some really riveting things. But what we tend to do in our culture is like we swing the pendulum, right? And we forget about the other stuff. And one of the things I really appreciate about you is, again, is coming from a place of balance. And you're actually looking at the brain. And whether people want to hear it or not, you're sharing the results of utilizing this substance in particular in the developing brain. And I want to circle this back to connect it to when we talked about the prefrontal cortex and a healthy prefrontal cortex and healthy activity being able to stop us from doing dumb shit or acting on or thinking thoughts that are hurting us or acting upon th thoughts that are hurting us because we have that regulatory force. Is marijuana something that can disrupt that connectivity? Absolutely. It is absolutely correct. And I published two studies, one on a thousand marijuana users. Every area of their brain compared to healthy was lower in blood flow, every area. And then I published the world's largest imaging study on 62,454 scans. And I looked at how the brain aged. And little kids have really busy brains. And as they go through adolescence in their early 20s, there's a process called pruning. So use it or lose it. And myelination, where each nerve cell gets wrapped with a white fatty substance called myelin. And our brain starts to myelinate, starts in the back when we're about two months old. And that's why when you smile at a baby about two months, they smile back. And then it slowly marches, but doesn't fully myelinate our prefrontal cortex until we're in our mid twenties. Mm. And marijuana decreases that process, damages that process it also damages the connections in the brain and you don't want to do that and it's common knowledge among those of us that treat addicts that if you start smoking pot around 15 and you stop around 30 emotionally you're sort of 15 and that's not a really great thing. And we're not teaching teenagers to love and care for their brain. I mean, they sort of think, and when I was 15, I thought I knew everything, even though my brain should have had a sign under construction. Mm. And why would you, if you're constructing this incredible building, would, would you really just like pour shit in it? Would, would you just damage it? Of, of course not, right? That's stupidity. And what I often ask my patients, I said, if you had a $10 million racehorse, would you ever feed it junk food? And would you ever get it high? And they're like, no, that would be stupid. And I'm like, well, why would that be stupid? Well, because that's an incredible investment. Mm -hmm. Well, you're worth way more than that animal. Yeah. It's perspective. You know, that would, that, Getting the horse drunk and high reminds me of Cocaine Bear. I don't know if you're looking forward to seeing that. <laughs> cocaine it's, Bear. I, it's coming I, soon. I want to see it. I saw the preview <laughs> for it. But teenagers who smoke marijuana or use marijuana in any form have a higher risk of anxiety, depression, suicide in their 20s. Teenagers who use marijuana, and this is a replicated study from Norway, have a 450% increased risk of becoming psychotic. And I'm the one over the last 40 years that I get to deal with marijuana triggered a psychotic episode and they're still not well. And psilocybin can do the same thing. And as we are coming into this era of marijuana's innocuous psilocybin 
is good medicine. And there may, in fact, be times when it is good medicine. Um, as the perception of a dangerousness of a drug goes down, use goes up. And, and I've been to this party before. In the 80s, uh, benzos were considered innocuous. And like when Xanax first came on the market, I used a lot of it. And then I started doing scans on them and I stopped using them altogether. Uh, Mommy's Little Helper is addictive and now we know increases the risk of dementia. In the 90s, you were sort of shamed if you didn't give people opiates. That my wife, again, who's a nurse, she would say, oh, pain is the fifth vital sign. Is every visit we had to ask them about their pain and if they had pain, we needed to relay that to the doctor so they could increase their opiate prescription. Well, everybody knows that did not turn out well. And people go, but marijuana is natural. You have cannabinoid receptors in the brain. Well, you also have benzoreceptors in the brain and you have opiate receptors in the brain and none of that turned out well. So why not, if you're anxious, let me teach you how to do diaphragmatic breathing. And there in the book, there's the 15 second breath. If you just do four of them, you won't need a Xanax. Or how about meditating? We found that increases blood flow to the brain, but calms down the emotional centers. Or why not exercise? I mean, head to head against antidepressants, exercise equally effective. Omega-3 fatty acids, equally effective. Learning how to believe, not believe every stupid thing you think equally. I mean, why are we not focusing on diet, on exercise, on building skills rather than, hey doc, what do you think about psilocybin? I was like, marijuana and psilocybin, the most common questions and the haters often go, Dr. Amen needs to get high. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I am, I'm high on life. <laughs> All right, so you mentioned something that I don't wanna miss and you said mommy's little help, helper and that was, the advertisements, you know, back in the day, that was how it was framed. Just like you just mentioned, 30 alcohol commercials during the Super Bowl, like how many commercials do we see for strawberries or whatever? Like we didn't see any kind of health affirming commercials, right? It's just inundating us with this. And so, but this dates back. Now we've gotten a little bit more, well, advertisers more clever in what they're packaging up and alcohol being the most socially acceptable psychoactive substance right which but it is it kills more people than any other psychoactive substance and it's been going at it for a long time but things like again xanax being framed as this is if if you're gonna handle life you got a lot on your plate mommy's little helper turn to us and you you mentioned also the fact that we have receptors for these things and what i would point to potentially is yes we do have receptors but what about the concentration of the things that people are consuming today. For example, having the opiate receptor, maybe this goes back thousands of years where poppy was used in spot cases when somebody was in serious pain, right? Versus a synthetic opioid like fentanyl, right? That con It's a completely different ball game. The same thing with the marijuana today when thousands of years, maybe they had some kind of rite of passage or a smoke ceremony. And today, like the concentration of things and the fact that people are doing it so consistently, it's just tearing our brains apart really from the inside out. You know, it just reminds me of another Bible verse. The beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. And the beginning of wisdom is to be very afraid of these substances. I mean, to have reverence for them because sometimes they can be incredibly helpful. Um, you know, we use benzos when someone's having a seizure that won't go away. And obviously pain meds after surgery or during cancer are absolutely essential, but we don't fear them, I think, like we, we should. Yeah. And, you know, that would lead me to talk about anxiety, that in the book I talk about you don't want to have a low level of anxiety that the don't worry, be happy people die the earliest 
from accidents and preventable illnesses. So if you think of anxiety on a scale of zero to 100, I think a healthy level sort of like 25, where you see the trouble coming for you and you avoid it. Mm. Um, so the goal is never no anxiety because that goes with going to jail and early death. The, the goal is the right dose of anxiety where you're not really suffering, but you're directing your life and you're seeing the obstacles that are in front of you. Like I used to love Rocky Road ice cream or what's the other flavor? Uh, pistachio almond fudge at Baskin Robbins. Love it. But it didn't love me. Mm. And so now I see that. So I walk by Baskin Robbins and I'm like, oh, that's death. Damn. That's obesity. <laughs> that's diabetes. That's heart disease. That's my grandfather who I loved that died early because he was a candy maker. Mm. And I'm like, no. And I love him. And he just didn't know, but it's like, no, I'm, I love my life. I love my wife. I love my children. I love my mission. I, no, no. <laughs> and, and it's that idea of only love someone or something that loves you back. I don't know if you've ever been in a bad relationship of course look at me <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a man I'm a person yes absolutely but I have yeah. and and I'm married now to my best friend um, I, I, I am not gonna be in a bad relationship with a substance or with food I am gonna be in control of me and I've made that decision and I want people who are watching this make the decision to only love things that love you back yeah and it, here's another little side note this doesn't mean it's going to be easy it's going to take growth and you talk about that in the book as well it took it takes time like one of my favorite stories early in the book is Nancy from Oxford England who was obese, um, a couch potato, in chronic pain, and depressed. And she's 80 years old. And she finds Change Your Brain, Change Your Life for 50 cents in a used bookstore in Oxford. And she buys it, lays around the house for a year. And when she's like, I feel so bad, maybe this will help. She read it cover to cover, outlined it, said she was riveted. And... She's like, okay, too much to do at once. So I'm just going to do one thing at a time. And she started drinking more water because the brain is 80% water. And I say, drink half your weight in ounces a day. It's just 200 pounds. So she's drinking 100 ounces of water. She said, got me off the couch because I had to pee. <laughs> <laughs> but she said, I felt better. And she's like, I'm going to take supplements and took multiple vitamin, omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D. Brand new study out on vitamin D. People who take vitamin D supplements have a 40% decreased risk of Alzheimer's disease. That's a prospective study. Uh, she goes, oh, I'm better still. And she goes, because of the omega-3 fatty acids, she's in less pain. She's like, I'm going to walk. And then she took dancing lessons. And then she started to play table tennis, my favorite brain game. And she's better still. And then she decides to change her diet. And she's like, I ate everything I wanted. I just ate the good things first so there was no room for the bad things and felt better. And then she started new learning. She started to learn French mm. and then play the guitar. And when I met her, she was learning three languages. Oh my goodness. And then she changed her family. And she came for her 83rd birthday, she came to California to get scanned. And I wasn't the one supposed to see her, so I've so seen one of my other doctors. But Crystal, my clinic director, said, you have to meet Nancy. And as I went and talked to her, 
like five minutes of this story, I start crying mm. <laughs> because oh. she's the reason why I do what I do. And she said, I lost five stones. Now, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> I'm like, she collects rocks. Or <laughs> but stone in England is 14 pounds. She lost 70 pounds. She said, I used to be like this and blew out her cheeks. She said, and now I'm not. And she said, I never imagined at my age that life could be this rewarding, wow. that life could be this good. And so for her 83rd birthday, she bought herself a scan at the clinic. And I've seen lots of 70, 80, nine year old, 90 year old brains. And it's bad news. It's just bad news. <laughs> and she had a stunningly beautiful brain. And she cried because she knew. And, and so the, the point of yeah. this story is you don't have to do everything at once. S start by drinking more water or start the first thing is this good for my brain or bad for it? Just sort of do an inventory as you make decisions throughout the day. Is this good for my brain or is it bad for it? And if you can answer that with information and love, love of yourself, love of your spouse, love of your children, love of your mission while you're on the planet, you just tend to make better decisions, right? It's not that you should do this, yuck, who wants to do that? It's love. And when I heard Drew Carey say, eating crappy food isn't a reward, it's a punishment. Hmm. He lost a lot of weight. I knew he would stay healthy because you got to first get yeah. your mind right. Yeah, yeah. And this behavior change, and you anchored this in in the book in several ways too, it's much easier to guide this behavior change with affirmative things. And so you talk about collecting penguins. Talk about that. <laughs> well, you know, the book is really formatted around these four big circles. I always think about it. So what's the biology? And we've talked a lot so far about brain health. What's the psychology? And I call them ants, the automatic negative thoughts that steal your happiness. What's the social circle? Like, how are you getting along with people? And what's the spiritual circle? Why the heck do you care? And on the social circle, I have things I collect for each of the circles, like for the brain, it's seahorses, for the hippocampus, and it's an anteater to get rid of the ants for the psychological circle, and butterflies for the spiritual circle because it's all about change. But it's penguins for the social circle. Why? Because it reminds me to notice what I like about other people more than what I don't. So my son just turned 46 yesterday. And I adopted him when he was three. So of our six kids, three of them are adopted. And he was hard for me. Because when you adopt a, a little boy, you're like so excited. I was so excited to be a dad. And I was so excited to have influence, to spend time. And he just argued with absolutely everything I said. And, uh, and I'm not feeling bonded. And when he's seven, uh, I'm in my child psychiatry fellowship in Hawaii. And I go to talk to my supervisor. And I'm like, I'm having real trouble with my son. And I don't like him that much. And it just seems like we're always fighting. And I don't like it. And my dad was not a good dad, mostly because he was gone. And I wanted to be a good dad. So I was sad. She said, I want you to spend more time with him, like actual physical time. And so I'm like, all right. And the whole Saturday, we went to a place called Sea Life Park, which is like SeaWorld uh, in Hawaii. It's on Oahu. And we went to the whale show, and that was fun. And then we went to the seal show, and that was cool. But at the end of the day, he grabs my shirt, and he said, I want to see Fat Freddy. I'm like, who's that? He's like, it's the penguin dad. Don't you know anything? And that's the kind of relationship we had. And so we see the Fat Freddy show. And Freddy is this chubby uh, penguin 
who's just freaking amazing. He climbs this high dive ladder, goes to the end of the board, bounces, jumps in the water, um, gets out, bolts with his nose, counts with his flippers, jumps through a hoop of fire. And I'm like blown away by this little bird. And at the end of the show, the trainer asked Freddie to go get something. And Freddie went and got it and he brought it right back. And in my mind, the world stopped. I'm like, damn, I asked this child to get something for me and he wants to have a discussion. And I knew Antony was smarter than the penguin. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm right. missing something here. Yeah. And so I go to the trainer afterwards and I'm like, how'd you get Freddie to do all these really cool things? No lie, she looks at my son and then she looked at me and she said, unlike parents, whenever Freddie does anything like what I want him to do, I notice him. I give him a hug and I give him a fish. And the light went on in my head that even though my son didn't like raw fish, my daughter totally would have worked with her because she had started with sushi when she was two. Um, but I realized I was like my dad. Whenever he did something good, I wasn't paying enough attention to him. But when he didn't do the things I wanted him to do, I gave him a ton of attention because I didn't want to raise bad children. So I was inadvertently teaching him to be troubled to get my attention. So I collect penguins as a way to remind myself to notice the good things about the people in my life more than the bad. I mean, think what would have happened if Freddie would have had a bad day and the trainer would have gotten a big stick and beaten the penguin or withheld love and affection from him. He would have never perform for her again because he wouldn't have trusted her. But people think, oh, I need to force my will on this child without a relationship. It doesn't work very well. So notice what you like more than what you don't. It, it's miraculous in how it will, if you're struggling in your relationship with your spouse, with your kids, the research shows if you have five times more positive comments than negative ones, you're less likely to get divorced, business teams make more money, and you'll be able to shape the important people in your life in a positive way. This book is so rich. It's so rich with this kind of information. It's amazing. So I want to go into, we've talked a lot about various perception shifts for things. And I know that when the average person thinks about improving their brain health, they're thinking about things they can do like exercises. And you also address that as well. Earlier, you mentioned table tennis being your favorite brain game can we talk about that a little bit more so table tennis what about pickleball pickleball is is popping right now so people who play racket sports mm -hmm. live longer than everybody else isn't that interesting because there's a part of the brain i call it the rodney dangerfield part of the brain and i'm horrified that so many people don't know who he was he's a very famous comedian who said i get no respect and just, I quoted him in my last book. So thank I you. Do. Thank you for that. Because it makes me feel old. <laughs> it's like people don't know who Neil Diamond is. It's like, really? Um, anyways, the cerebellum, back bottom part of the brain, it's 10% of the brain's volume. But it has more than half of the brain's neurons. It's critically important. And one of its main functions is coordination physical coordination, but also thought coordination and how quickly you can process information. And you table tennis, and the reason I like it better than pickleball is it's faster. And there's a lot of spin and a lot of thinking that when you play at a high level, it's a strategy game. So reflex, fast reflex, very aerobic, and it's strategic. So it's working out your cerebellum. It's working out your parietal lobes in the top back part of your brain. They see where the ball is in space. And it's working out your frontal lobes because you are always creating strategy. 
And so it's this great whole brain exercise. Now, it's not beer pong. I mean, let's just be really <laughs> clear. It's not beer pong. And it's not just, you know, hitting the ball back and forth. It's like thinking about it. So I teach yeah. my patients, go get a coach, get good. This will help rehabilitate your brain. So awesome. I love that. This is like, it's happening. Because of this moment right now, I've been wanting to get a ping pong table in my basement for the longest. And so I'm gonna make that happen within the next week because of this conversation. Send me a picture. Oh, I'm done, <laughs> done. I get to, you know, go at my kids. Um, and also, but you mentioned racket sports overall. So I would imagine again, tennis, um, there's badminton, plus you've got a shuttlecock with that, which is like the most gangster of all names of sports <laughs> uh, pieces. Um, and then again, pickleball is rising in popularity. So, and it just makes sense. There's the coordination piece. There's looking at, it's kind of like, you said something about it being related to chess. It's aerobic chess. Aerobic chess. Yeah, you said that. I was like, oh, yeah. that's, that's amazing. It's a and, great way to think about it. You know, a funny story. My grandson, um, I have five grandkids and adore them all. The oldest one, he, when we play, he wants to beat me. And I'm like way better than he is. And I'm like, you need to stop that and pay attention because I'm going to teach you how to beat all of your friends. Mm -hmm. And every time you make a mistake, because he tended to be hard on himself, mm -hmm. it's like, no, no, we celebrate mistakes because then we learn. So we win or we learn. We win or we learn. And I think that mindset is so important is you take bad days and you turn them into good data. So win or you learn, win or you learn. And it's public knowledge. Alicia Newman's one of my patients. She's a Canadian pole vaulter. And she was in the last Olympics and had a head injury and didn't do well. She ended up with something called Erlen syndrome, which I talk about in the book. It's a visual processing problem. And she's really negative and hard on herself. And we do this mantra of win or learn and then visualize. We don't visualize any negativity. We visualize a lot, but we do it on what she does right. And it just came out, I think, two weeks ago. She uh, won the World Indoor Pole Vaulting Championships for women. And I'm just so proud of her and we win or we learn. So awesome, so awesome. So we've got, and also I just wanna mention this other point, which is with table tennis and with tennis, we have something that is great for our brains in a variety of ways, plus we're avoiding things that are not great for our brains, which is the contact. You mentioned the NFL study that you participated in, and really, I mean, you were such a guiding force of it, and also, um, you know, MMA fighting and whatnot, and. You mentioned to me in another conversation about what the actual worst sport for your brain is. Can you reference that? I think you, I think you said soccer. Soccer is not good for the brain, but you know, if you look at all of them, what's worse, probably boxing. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm blessed to have Muhammad Ali's brain right. and Mike Tyson's brain and I have four world heavyweight championships and they're hurt. I mean, you know, just think, yes, and people course. don't get it. They think, you know, the headgear protects them or the helmet protects them. And it's a lie. Or the, the cushy glove that's punching you in the because face. Because your brain is not anchored in your skull. Your brain floats in water. And so even if you have a helmet on and you get whacked, your brain shakes just like shaken baby syndrome. And we know if you shake a baby, it can cause long-term learning problems. It can cause damage. It's clearly an abusive act. Well, if your helmet is hitting somebody else's helmet, inside your brain is shaking. And Joe Lewis, the famous boxer said, it's not the big hits that cause dementia. It's the thousands of little hits, the sub-concussive blows. Mm -hmm. And would I let my children play football? Absolutely not, right? If I love this child, why would I increase the risk 
of him having multiple concussions. I mean, on average, people who play football have a concussion every year. And it's like you're, you're not taking the long-term view that when you're older and your children might need to care for you, you want their brains to be okay. So I always take the long-term view. One of the things that you've really been uh, even popularizing, this is a treatment to help with issues like that, is hyperbaric oxygen. And, you know, being here in L.A., there are businesses that just have hyperbaric oxygen chambers. You know, there are, it's so interesting where, you know, back in the day, meditation was kind of a fringe thing. Now there's straight whole meditation studios just for that one thing. We saw the rise in popularity with yoga. Now it's like light therapy beds and hyperbaric oxygen. Can you talk about what hyperbaric oxygen is and also what kind of benefits does it have for our brain? So I first learned about it. Oh, goodness, almost 30 years ago. Mike Usler, who was a nuclear medicine doctor at UCLA. Um, I do scans, he did spec scans, and he said, Dan, you have to look at these images. This is before and after people who go in hyperbaric chambers. And I hadn't heard about it. I'm like, oh, that's so interesting. So I started following the medical literature and they're really good for people who have low blood flow to the brain. So whatever is causing that. And then when I was doing my NFL work, I'm like, they all have low blood flow to their brain. So I would send them, and I have many before and after scans. And then I did a study uh, with Paul Harch on soldiers who had been involved in blast injuries. Uh, and we saw significant improvements in cognitive function, emotional status, blood flow to the brain. So hyperbaric oxygen is you go in a chamber and they pressurize the chamber anywhere from 1.3 atmospheres to 2.5 atmospheres. So like go under deeper and deeper pressures of water and often at 100% oxygen and it causes this nice repairing effect in the brain, increases vasculature, increases stem cell production, and it doesn't work for everyone. But one of my favorite stories is my dad, as he got to be like 88, he started having funny moments. And this is a guy that didn't have funny moments. Uh, um, but he started seeing like little men running around the ceiling. And I'm like, oh my God. And I scanned him and I could see the aging brain had low blood flow, put him in the hyperbaric chamber for 30 sessions and the little people went away. And he says, wow, I have better energy, I have better concentration, and the people aren't there. <laughs> <laughs> now this goes back to the fact that we all have these little people in our heads. We do, you know, we see well, things not that are at not night there where we're actually the seeing them right. on the wall. Right, <laughs> being able to discern the difference, you know. Um, I wanna ask you about this because we talked about more of a physical activity that's great for our brain, being racket sports. But you also have one of the days as we go in this kind of successive order, the best mental exercises for the brain. And you talk about that. So one of them was to spend 15 minutes a day learning something new. Why is that so good for the brain? And that's the most important exercise because when you learn something new, the brain makes new connections. And when you stop learning, the brain starts to disconnect itself. And so this is why retirement, like I'll never retire, uh, and do what, right? I don't play golf, or at least when I do, I swear way too much. It's <laughs> bad for my eternal soul. Um, <laughs> what are you saying new, out there, Daniel? New learning is, is just essential. And for me, like I read scans, I can't just do that because my brain already knows how to do it. And once you know how to do something, your brain uses less and less energy. Like I look at a scan and I immediately know what it means. So whether it's piano or a language or um, new imaging modalities, I need to constantly be learning. And I think it was Einstein who said, if you just spend 15 minutes a day learning something new, 
in a year, you'll be an expert. In five years, you'll be a national expert. I was like, hey, that's cool, and that's not much time. So yeah. as you do physical exercise, it's critical to do mental exercises. And people often come up to me and go, I do crossword puzzles. And I'm like, well, what else do you do? And they go, no, that's all I'm doing for my brain. And I'm like, oh, that's sort of like going to the gym, doing right bicep curls, and then leaving. Mm. It's like you want to work out your whole brain, which is why I like table tennis. Oh, man. One other one I want to ask you about, which it seems kind of strange because you just mentioned how repetition, our brain can kind of go on autopilot with certain things. We're laying down more myelin, right? You talk about stepping out of our routines as well as something of kind of like a mental exercise. Talk about yes, that. if you do something new, if you do something different, if you get out of your comfort zone, you're stressing your brain. And a little bit of stress is good. It's called eustress. Um, if you don't have enough stress, so for example, if children are raised in a wealthy family and everything's done for them, they actually end up suffering because of that, because they've not stressed their brains enough to help them be hardy. And so some stress is essential. Obviously, it's like some anxieties, essential. It's sort of a dose <laughs> response. You wanna push your brain. Uh, and so whether it's brushing your teeth with the opposite hand that you usually do, or practicing table tennis with the opposite hand. Or if you really want to be good at a sport, well, practice using both hands to do it. So awesome. And when you're doing that, brushing your teeth with the opposite hand, make sure you do a good job <laughs> so you're not out here with stank breath. Well, and make sure you floss because people who have gum disease have brain disease. Very important. In the book, there's this mnemonic, bright minds, you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors. And the first I in bright minds is inflammation. And gum disease is a major cause of inflammation. So many nuggets like this. And you map it out for us so we could take a little bit each day, a daily dose. Can you let folks know where they can pick up this new book and also just follow you, get into your universe more and get more information? So they can get the book anywhere great books are sold. And um, if they want to learn about our clinical work, they can go to amenclinics.com. We now have 11 clinics around the country. Um, they can follow me on TikTok, uh, Doc Amen, D-O-C-A-M-E-N, or on Instagram at Doc underscore Amen. And there they can see our episode of Scan My Brain. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. What if I told you these are diseases of skeletal muscle first? And that obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cardiovascular disease begin in skeletal muscle first. Insulin resistance begins in skeletal muscle first. And if we care about root cause medicine, then we have to care about skeletal muscle.